Fuck it. Fuck it. Do it live. <clears throat> we'll do it live. We'll do it live. Fuck it. Yeah, why not? Let's do it live. Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it all. Anyway, <laughs> today on Stumbling Down History Road, we're going to be talking about the history of guns and pretty much how they came to be. Uh, I am Jackson. I'm D. And yes. I'm the guy on the phone. There That's we the go. the guy on the phone. Anywho. All right. So who wants to start us off? Uh, so we're doing like... Every? Just broad, yeah, broad overview. We can get into more specifics down the line. All right. You um, know, like uh, insert favorite fan, uh, favorite manufacturer here, whoever's going to pay us. <laughs> yeah, not totally. sponsored. Not, not, not sponsored. sponsored. Not, not sponsored. sponsored by any gun manufacturers. No. That would be cool, though. It would be neat. It would be very cool. Yeah. Mm. Not sponsored by Coca-Cola, despite us having all this shit around us. Mm. Yep. Right there. Uh, I'm not sponsored by my roll top desk. <laughs> <laughs> not sponsored. Any. Not sponsored. All right, got that out of the way, I guess then. Yeah. Yep. So Whatever. who wants to start us off? Where Where should we begin with the history of guns? Uh, I mean the invention hmm. of gunpowder. Yeah. All right. Let's Let's yep. talk about the history of gunpowder. That's uh That seems like a pretty good idea. Do you know what it was yeah. originally called? No. What? Uh, something Chinese. I don't know off the top of my head. Exactly. Neither do I. I just was yep. hoping you did. As it turns no, out, uh, gunpowder was invented in China in the uh, eighth or uh, sorry, in the ninth or tenth century. Yep. Yep. Um, it was initially used uh, for like fireworks and stuff, fireworks and yeah. all that sort of stuff, and. Which eventually, you know, ended up making its way to the battlefield because, as it turns out, pretty much anything that is effectively an explosive uh, somehow ends up making its way into the battlefield. Yeah. But they would use it for, like, fireworks and making, you know, super pretty celebrations. They would use it for uh, what they called the flaming arrows, which were... Effective. Arrows that were on fire? Yeah, they were arrows that were on fire. Mythbusters did something about it, not sponsored. Uh, right. That was effectively just a whole bunch of gunpowder propelled arrows, which was, yep. you know, kind of brutal, kind of badass. Mm. They yep. would load up. Deep stuff. <coughs> they would load up mm. uh, basically cannons and, you know, just start firing projectiles that way. Yeah, I guess cannons and mortars were the precursors to firearms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they needed something that the warriors could carry by, by themselves. Yeah, so that's where we end up getting into the hand cannons. That comes about during like the 14th century, where people start right. using them in much, much smaller degrees. And uh, mm -hmm. they have like wooden blocks, they have wooden stocks just on the chest in order to yeah. uh, more or less be able to, <clears throat> like I said, use it as a hand cannon. Yeah, to transport it made it easier. They were very, uh, the stocks or handles or whatever, very rudimentary, very crude, just, you know, basic enough to mount the, uh, the lock work and, and the barrel and, and all that stuff. So, I mean, that's as time went on. It, work. Yeah. It a could. lot of it was just very super, uh, super, the super rudimentary, like match block uh, style. Yes. Uh, Even then, it could have just been literally just a piece. With a of fuse, yeah. Fuse and a. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, what actually, right. like, makes a cannon? Uh, uh, like, how would we define a cannon since this is a precursor to a gun? Big tube. That you load up. Great with, big, uh, heavy tube. Yeah. You does it have to be big and heavy if it's a hand cannon? Well, a hand cannon is like just... Does it, have to be, does it have to be like super big and heavy if it's a hand cannon? So we were talking about that too. I'm sure, I'm sure it weighed a bit. You, know, <clears throat> to, you need a... Um, it's literally just a... The barrel, the breech, the, you know, all that stuff has to be pretty heavyweight stuff to handle the, the explosion of the, the black powder and all. And to project the, 
projectile. This is true. Yes. All right. So you you say black powder. What exactly is black powder consisted of? We're not giving out any you know recipes in order to uh, sulfur. Salt we're just looking eater. for the 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 ingredients behind it. No particular parts. No particular ratio. So YouTube, don't don't kill us. Yeah. Um, totally honest, I couldn't tell you. I don't know what the properties are. It was sulfur, saltpeter, and uh, charcoal. Yeah. Sounds about right. Sulfur, saltpeter, and charcoal. <coughs> saltpeter is also right. referred to as uh, potassium nitrate. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say it's only with nitrate in it. Yeah, it's potassium nitrate. <coughs> uh, <coughs> but, mm, pardon me. It's also kind of like a misnomer about it exploding. All an explosion really is is just really, really, really uh, combustible, well, super, super powered uh, chemical reaction that just burns at an incredibly high, high pace, an incredibly high speed, which yeah. creates a lot of force, a lot of gas, and that ends up being what's dubbed an explosion. Otherwise, without that, <laughs> it won't explode on the ground. It'll just burn. You know, it needs something to actually contain it and pressurize it in order to make anything. Well, yes and no. I mean, there has to be I some mean, type of resistance that will. What's up? You could cook off a bullet. Uh, yeah. Not for very long. <laughs> you know, it's it's the powder <laughs> nowadays. The the um, uh, the smokeless powder because black powder was very uh, rudimentary. It was a. It was it was burned slower than the the powder that is used these days, and it made a lot of smoke. So yes. in 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 and around the 1890s through 1910 or thereabouts, pretty much all the manufacturers switched over to smoke smoke with powder, and they had to uh, beef up uh, the guns to be able to handle that. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> Yeah. Um, black powder, um, all it needs is a spark. It doesn't need to be contained in anything, um, but all it needs is a spark to light it. And it. Oh, I was only, you know, I was only talking about the containment part in order to actually build up the pressure and cause said explosion, oh. not in order yes. for it to actually ignite. It is okay. It is very, very combustible. Do not play with this yeah. at home. This is not any advice on no. how to. You know, play with any of this shit. Uh, speaking of, we should go yeah. over some of the universal safety laws, which everybody should know yeah. about if they ever get involved with some of this. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Right. Rule rule one is never run black powder up and down in driveway ten or twelve times over a slug, and then light it. <laughs> uh, Don't do that. No. Rule number one is treat every weapon as if it were loaded. I thought Correct. it was. That is one hundred percent. If you ever see a firearm, assume it is loaded 100%. Make sure you do all of the safety checks to verify that, you know, there is nothing that can possibly <coughs> go wrong and fire on you. That is Correct. rule number one. And then after that, people have their own ways of phrasing it, but it's effectively uh, the way that we learned it in the, na uh, in the Navy was treat, never keep, keep. So... Treat every weapon as if it were loaded. Treat what? Treat, never, yeah. keep, keep. Treat every weapon as if it were loaded. Never point okay. your weapon at anything you don't intend to fire. Keep your weapon on safety until ready to fire. Keep your finger off the trigger until ready to fire. Right. Oh, and always also, be aware of what's beyond your target. Exactly. That, no, it, that's that number projectile, five. <laughs> for, that projectile you own until it stops. Yeah. But if it you know, hit something, destroy something, takes a life, it's your responsibility. 100%. <clears throat> Forever. So, but. for anyone, all, you know, 40 of our subscribers, all maybe like, I don't know, 50 people that are going to watch this, those are the safety rules. Assume it for any and all firearm that you find. Even the black powder ones. Yes. Especially Correct. the black powder ones. All right, so now that we have some safety rules out of the way, uh, 
let's get into how this whole gunpowder, black powder cannons, they all started to <coughs> evolve and get away from just fireworks and rudimentary cannons in China. Sounds good. Well, I mean, anything when it comes to people is always refined for war. Well, I was talking more so about how it ended up going from China to Europe, because that's where we end up getting a lot of our next big inventions and a lot of our next big, uh, you know, steps in terms of any advancement. Well, I mean, I would assume it was probably, you know, yeah, trading. Trading. Uh, people speculate uh, the Mongols when, you know, Genghis Khan and them started to arise and started <coughs> to interfere and integrate with a lot of Europe that he was going in invading, and obviously he went to China and started collecting some of that shit. So that's where a lot of it's speculized on coming from. There's not much that speculized? actually... Speculized? Speculized. That'll work. It's a perfectly cromulent word. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I like it. From what I found, pretty much it wasn't until about the 14th century that it didn't actually start to come into any sort of popularity or notoriety in uh, Europe. And that's where we start seeing, like, hand cannons come about and things like that. And well, wasn't it, like, the Italians who started, who made, like, some of the first pistol, uh, uh, wheel lock pistols and stuff? Uh, for wheel lock? Are you... That's the one where you, like, twist it up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that uses <laughs> effectively, like, <laughs> clock gear work and... We'll get into this more specifically, but I want to say that was the Italians. Because allegedly it was invented by Leonardo da Vinci or some bullshit. He probably had his hands in it somewhere. I mean, have you seen some of the like crazy war machines he came up with? Yeah. He, uh, yeah, he, was, he, he was ahead he of his time. He was something else. <clears throat> I, I got to say something here. I feel like I'm very unprepared for this. You... you uh, you guys are much more well read up at the moment than I am. Nope. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo, Google. Uh, not, spe- uh, not sponsored by Google. But I digress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about a couple of the different like firing mechanisms since we decided to just go into wheel lock. We got the match lock, the flint lock, the wheel lock. Those are probably the three biggest of the era up until about the early 1800s. Uh, Correct. But that was used predominantly. Yeah, that's when you got mm-hmm. the invention of the cap system. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, so, uh... so the match lock, do, you, do either of you guys... The match lock is the one that uses a, typically uses like a, a hemp fuse, right? Yeah, so it uses a hemp fuse. And, I think so. And you actually have to <clears throat> pull the trigger in order to make the hemp fuse connect with the gunpowder, which ignites uh, in a tray. It ignites the gunpowder in the cylinder or the barrel, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, and then that ends up, you know, propelling the yeah, yeah. round. Your your uh, humidity factors and your uh, weather conditions greatly affected uh, warfare at the time. If you're if you had the match lock where you put a little bit of powder in a cup on the side of the barrel, if it was raining out, you weren't fighting that day. Well, that would also happen with uh, the flint lock, but it was less likely to happen. Now, Correct. The flint, the flint lock, lock um, the powder went, actually the powder was in the barrel. Um, so no, that still had, it, it was in the barrel, yes, but <clears throat> so was the match lock. But the, the powder mm-hmm. ended up having its own little uh, tray that you would end up seeing almost like an L in a lot of the, uh, in the movies, like a flap that yeah. would protect it and cover it and have a striker for the flint to actually mm-hmm. cause the ignition. So it would protect it mostly <laughs> by having right. that tray on top of it, but it right. would still have a small section where, you know, it actually has to catch the spark and so it would be exposed that way and right. if it was rainy or wet during the time that you put the gunpowder into the tray you know you still have the chance that way and there's still the little hole that could get like that's what yeah. i was talking about with the catching the spark yeah. from the flint lock well because there's the hole that feeds into the barrel where the powder yeah yeah 
Yes. For uh, the spark to go into. Yeah, and then the wheel lock basically uses pyrite and steel, and it would just rub up against it in order to create a spark that way. Yeah. It was very intricate. It had like a little... Very <coughs> expensive. They were amazing uh, uh, pieces of... Um, uh, Machinery. Uh, or, or whatever. It's just the way they were uh, designed and made with such crude uh, tools and stuff of the time, it's, it, it, they're pretty incredible. Yeah. They really I mean, are. Uh, have you seen some of these like primitive technology guys? The things they could do with those things in general is always like crazy. Yep. Yeah. So. Yep. Just, you know, but so anyway. So that's, this is all different ways for effectively a musket to fire, mm -hmm. which is right. completely different from a rifle. And you can have, Correct. you know, still a mustard uh, musket style uh, pistol, which would still <coughs> use a similar way. Those were typically uh, used by officers, cavalry. It was used a lot by, you know, you would see on Pirates of the Caribbean, they would have a lot of side pieces, uh, things like yes. that. Predominantly yep. for the infantry, the general militia, they would always have a rifle. They would have a lot of ways of just getting it loaded and ready to fire. There was a lot of tactic built around it as well. So Back during the Civil War, uh, the uh, Revolutionary, War, Revolutionary War era through the Civil War, when uh, they were still using muskets that were you know, fed through the barrel and everything, <clears throat> a, a good soldier could probably get off three rounds per minute if he was really on his game. And, and, and that yeah. was under fire. Yeah, so that's the, that's the standard of a good soldier from everything that yeah. I've looked up. About three rounds <clears throat> a minute, which doesn't yep. sound like a lot nowadays, but back then, I mean, that was yeah. incredible. I, to Consider a, the chaos that was going on at the time. You're being shot at. Yeah, and you know you're taking a knee to do this. That said, and, and that said, it wasn't impossible for people to get off <coughs> five or six in you know optimal conditions nowadays with all of the training and you know all of the right technique and no no added stress of being fired upon. Nothing along those lines. It was it's right. entirely possible these days under you know perfect conditions to get five six rounds in a minute. Yeah. Uh, but you mentioned for musket that it was still all barrel fed, which it well, yeah, you you know you you put the powder in, then the wad, then the uh, the projectile, and you tap it in. So from I, 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 perhaps it's not the right term, but you know you, you got to no. feed the gun through the barrel instead of through the breech. So even with uh, rifles back during the time, because there was rifles during the time, which we'll sure. get into the difference. It was still barrel fed yes uh since we mentioned it want to talk about the difference between a rifle and a musket anyone a rifle has what is known as rifling in the uh the length of the barrel it's it's twists at uh different rates but there's lands and grooves typically there's five to six la um <clears throat> lines and grooves and if you look down the barrel you can see them all um different twist rates are for different uh size projectiles as well as velocity um a musket has a smooth bore yes um like a shotgun yeah that's one of the <clears throat> that's one of the key characteristics that so what do or the, the key characteristic that differentiates a musket to a, a rifle so now what exactly Correct. do those grooves do they spin the projectile, and that gives it velocity and stability in its flight. Yeah, just like uh, somebody throwing a, you know, for America, because we're here, uh, football. You add the spiral, right. it helps aid in the stability. Ah, Correct. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Yeah. And like I said, you know, you'll come across uh, firearms that you know, they can go from, a, say, one in six or one in 12, one in 14, so on and so forth. That's how many twists there are. 
um, per foot, I believe it is. Hmm. Um, but it's it's <clears throat> again, it's all based on the the grain weight of the projectile and the um, the, the velocity, velocity of the projectile, the size, you know, everything. Yeah. yeah, if it's if it's a long distance shooting rifle, so on and so forth. Yeah, hmm. so. interesting. Uh, Typically, right. handguns will will have a uh, a higher twist rate because they have shorter barrels, and they're you that know tracks. meant for close social work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But rifling started to uh, come about actually with arrows and crossbows and things of that nature back in the 14th mm-hmm. century. Yeah, they started yeah. implementing rifling on crossbows back in the 14th century. Which, oh, that's cool. Uh huh. Hmm. But they uh, added a oh. twist to the to the bolt, so they oh, would the, they would add uh, the uh, the fletching the fletching yeah they uh, would have okay. a twist to the fletching which would as it flies through the air cause the air to spin around it causing it to spin through the air right. as it were uh, and then as stated increased stability. Oh, okay, yeah, mm-hmm. makes sense now. The, the reason that rifles weren't as popular as muskets during the time was because just how how susceptible it was to fouling caused by the black powder. Because it causes a lot of... Uh, can, can you explain a little bit about black powder versus smokeless? Black powder is very, very dirty. There are modern black powder rifles that people use for hunting and uh, sporting things. Um, it's, they are very, very dirty. They foul the, uh, the the chamber, the breech, the barrel, leave all kinds of thick residue. They have Anytime you go out and shoot one, when you're done shooting, you have to take the gun apart and scrub it clean. Soap and water, which... You don't use in a regular gun, but yeah. soap and water, oil, it's its really. Um, now, is it a, a carbon? A dirty... Is it like a carbon soot? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's probably a carbon yeah. based soot, yeah. And if, and if you're using lead balls uh, as tradition, most ammo these days is, is, is lead, um, <coughs> whether it's open lead or jacketed. Uh, lead could also foul the. Um, the rings and lands um, in a rifle or a handgun that's easier to get out but um, yeah black powder is a very very dirty um, way of shooting it makes it creates a great cloud it, it doesn't sound anything like a gun it's it doesn't have that sharp crack it's more like a whoosh boom yeah um, it's very it's distinct if you've ever stuff. gotten to watch it on you know any type of movie it's very distinct yeah or or, or even a documentary in person yeah yeah you know i i live in an area where you hear gunshots every day and um <clears throat> excuse me you can always tell the difference between a you know a standard modern gun and a black powder gun it's not that there good. aren't standard modern black powder guns <clears throat> just no no absolutely they are modern black powder guns but you know as opposed to a smokeless powder gun yeah. so hmm. but it's very distinctive but so. but yeah that's more or less why it was more uh, that's more or less why it was used as like the general infantry the the common weapon of choice was a musket they didn't have to worry about the fouling up they didn't have to clean it after every day things of that nature which played mm-hmm. a large part in the American Revolution because yep. we had a lot of rifles and muskets as opposed to just yes, we muskets. Did. We were a lot more accurate. We were able to actually use some guerrilla tactics. Well, I mean, that's... Which uh, we learned from a general who learned it from in Native Americans during the French and Indian War, but... Besides yep, people. and Mel Gibson. Yeah, that guy. Hmm. That, that racist... <laughs> Anti Semite? We love you, Mel. Good yeah. actor. Just a bit of a shit <laughs> person. Whatever. <laughs> the, um. I mean, I don't he, know if we're uh, at that point yet, but a big game changer with mus- uh, 
early rifles, black powder was the invention of the mini ball as opposed to a standard ball that they would use. Oh, that um, one's almost oh, like yeah, buckshot, more conical. No, no, uh, yeah, it's more conical. It it came to a little bit of a point, That's but on the back okay. side of it, it was concave, so it would react better. You know, the the powder would pushed it out faster than a ball. You know, if, if it expanded, you picture a profile a of a ball. To... Uh, what's that? It would ex- the concave would expand in the back a little bit, allowing it to uh, get more air pressure behind it. Exactly, it kind of sealed up the uh, the, the barrel chamber. and the chamber and everything. Yeah, so most it, instead of it too. sneaking around it, so that was a big game changer between that and and rifling. That changed everything. So, oh. That said, we were still using the steel and lead <clears throat> balls for muskets and rifles of the the era that we're talking about. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's all right. Uh, let's, I mean, we pretty much went from that to whatever we're using now. And, well, we're going to go on to percussion caps now. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, oh, yeah, percussion mm-hmm. caps. Okay. Yeah, because we got to talk about that. Then we can talk about everything being integrated and the next, you know, meh, line and invention. I suppose. Sounds good. You want to talk a little bit about percussion caps? So, sure. So, go ahead. They're like little tiny brass buttons, like, and they are filled with a a uh, a powder mixture that, when struck with uh, force, would uh, give like a small ignition. And you would put them instead of using like every because they're more contained and everything. You just put them on the little thing, and when they're hit, they'd make the thing go off. Ah, fire. Yeah, they, the the caps sit on um like a little basically a nipple yeah yeah nipple. it's 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 a, a little hollow nipple yep. the cap will sit on that nipple. and the hammer will strike it causing it to spark the spark goes through the nipple into the chamber to ignite the powder and launch the projectile it's yeah the, that, it's that that's been debated on who actually invented that there's a right. there's a few different rumors for it one of which being mm-hmm. a guy, John Forsyth. He's uh, right. 1809 is when he first credited himself doing that, but he didn't actually patent it, in, uh, patent it until 1822. Uh, there was some mm-hmm. other earlier patents for it, uh, the first being French in 1817, then another dude in Italy in 1820 of all similar designs. Uh, yeah, it's and they all kind of, uh, yeah convergent evolution type thing yeah so yeah. but it it was in fact a real game changer when it came along it, it speeded things up quite a bit um it, it was it it was a great invention yeah we were able to uh basically have multi rounds loaded up and load up six you know like as, we were able to basically get a revolver that's more or less how Multi shots came about, if I recall. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, it wasn't um, you know it was it wasn't what we think of with the Wild West revolver, but we were still able to load up a few different rounds on a cylinder and be able to cycle through that while putting on different caps. I like the duck foot. Right. Those yeah. Are funny. Like, the duck foot Colt, as well. Colt came out with his revolver in I believe eighteen thirty six. And is that the <coughs> first me. invention of a revolver that uh, we're aware of? That it, it's well, Colt I certainly mean, is credited for it because he was, you know, he forced his issues. I mean, what's um, Colt two boxes are, technically the first revolvers. Colt two. What's that? Colt Pepper two. boxes. No, not really. Not really. The, the 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 it's the cylinder that revolves that makes it a revolver. The Pepper boxes, I don't know if they rotated. Um, there they was didn't. A they thing. didn't uh, rotate based off of mechanical, but you would rotate through it. You yourself. would rotate it by hand. So right. uh, yes okay. and no. Uh, there was. Um, we should mention that. Uh, eh, we'll talk about that later. Mm-hmm. We'll get. We're getting ahead of ourselves on that one. Okay. But um, 
there was there's believed to be a French revolver design very similar to Colt's. There's you know there's people who say that Colt stole the idea from him. Um, Colt himself claims he got the idea for him from uh, a sailing ship's wheel when he was, um, I guess, a merchant marine in his late teens, traveling back and forth to Europe. And again, this is uh, Uh, Colt 2. And we're not sponsored by them. No, you never said his first name. Oh, Samuel Colt? Samuel Colt. Yeah. In case anybody decides to look him up, not that you couldn't find out who Sam Colt is just from, you know, that, but it's good to have a little bit of extra. A lot of people know him from Supernatural now. Yeah. Oh, God. Well, he uh, he was quite a character. He would go from one invention to another. Um, you know, whatever, uh, you know, twisted his beanie at the time. He's credited with making the, the first electric torpedoes that he used to blow up in New York Harbor all the time. Mm. But um, he's, uh, yeah, he was a character. Um, well, like read him. a good biography on him not too long ago. But yeah, that, but, uh, I, I would say that the revolver and the rotating cylinder was effectively the first, like, mass-produced, multi-shot thing that you could actually, like, reliably get away with. Right? Right. Yeah. I mean, ro- well, revolvers a, at the his... time didn't really have it. You still needed to... <clears throat> there was no... Because we were still using the the old wad and gunpowder and loading everything up through the barrel at the time. So you would have right. the cylinder that would rotate, which is what I was trying to allude to being like the first multi-shot, the first... Yeah, the uh, percussion yes. cap revolvers. Yeah. But, but, yeah, the, the first percussion caps, you still had to... Um, yeah, you still had to Either load everything put, up and break, yeah. Exactly, I wasn't saying break that the gun that, down to the cylinder. I wasn't trying uh, to say that that was the modern day bullet, the modern day round oh, no, no, cartridge, no, no, whatever you not decide to call it. Not even, not even close. No. Um, it's it, it, it sped things up for certain, and it it made uh, um, a lot of outlaws. It made a lot of outlaws. The revolvers. Yeah. It's um, initially when he came, when he made his guns and uh, and they came out in 36, they were pretty much of a failure and he went broke and and, uh, kind of abandoned it until 10, 15 years later or so. And I'm sure somebody out there is going to correct me, but um, he came out with a newer design. And he equipped the Texas Rangers, the early Texas Rangers, with these guns. And the Indians were quite surprised by, you know, how fast that they were uh, getting shot at because they had no idea what these revolvers were. Yeah. You know, they were used to uh, Texas Rangers shooting at them once that happened to reload. And that's when they'd run in and scalp them and stuff. But, yeah, yeah it, it, uh, it, it was it a was game, game changer. changer for sure. Yeah. And then there was rifles that were essentially revolvers with longer barrels and, and a stock fitted. Um, but uh, multi-shot. Uh, Again, as alluded to, the, the duck foot, the pepper box, there were a couple other uh, like things where, yeah, multi-barrels. But the revolver was effectively the first singular barrel that had a rotating cylinder and was able to actually get off multiple rounds that way. Yeah, that's cool. So perhaps I've been getting ahead of myself. I don't know. Where are we at? Uh, we were just talking about how the revolver was, again, <coughs> the first singular barrel but multi-round as opposed to, like, the pepper box, the duck foot, and other very funny named guns of the nature. Yes. Where it was multi barrel in order to get off multiple shots correct um, yeah it uh it was quite the invention so who else competed with colt at the time in terms of you know him inventing the right. revolver uh, let's let's get into well, a little bit of the 1800s in the forte there was um numerous firearms manufacturers it was quite the big business especially up in new england connecticut um, where most of it was manufacturing 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the majority of the country's manufacturing was done there because, well, that's where the country, you know, the country started. And pretty much all these manufacturers were based on the rivers because they used the water for power. Um, the biggest competitor wound up becoming what is now known as Smith & Wesson um, when one of Colt's engineers designed a um, self-contained cartridge, a metallic cartridge. And Colt basically said, you're nuts, this is shit, and it's not my design, be gone with you. Hmm. So he went and sold it to Smith & Wesson. You know, or what is now known as Smith & Wesson? Yes. Uh, the, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. It, it, but uh, also at that. the time, there was Henry. Um, I can't That was his last name. He came up with his, what is known as the Henry rifle, yep. which was a, you know, a lever action gun. And he couldn't manufacture it himself, so it was manufactured through Winchester. It was came out about 1860 1861 well, and it, well it, in order to ahead. get in order to get to the lever action rifle we needed to have mm -hmm. uh more of a self-contained cartridge right couldn't just yes so let's talk about um, that let's let's bring yeah. that into the array and we'll talk about that and sure. how that again changed the game sure so want to get started yeah. since you uh <clears throat> yeah, I suppose so. Uh, I cannot think of the, the uh, engineer's name, but it basically it's a, it's a brass casing um, with a primer in it, which is essentially the same as the primer caps that were used uh, on the black powder guns. Mm -hmm. You know, they, uh, they're just much smaller. Actually, I digress. They were first um, rim fire uh projectiles <clears throat> what rim fire is it doesn't have a it doesn't have a primer uh, cap it doesn't have a primer cap the firing pin strikes the rim which has the igniter in it and that in turn sets off the black powder and away your projectile goes so that's was the easiest cheapest way to manufacture it at the time the uh, self-contained cartridge, again, like I said, it was usually brass. Yep. Uh, that a nice soft way metal. A nice comparison. soft metal. Um, well, lens is soft metal, too. It's primer, well, it's powder, it, and, it's, and it's bullet. It's, uh, so. it's harder than lead, but it's softer than steel, which uh, is okay. right. a lot of what you know is used in rifles and guns. Mm -hmm. So... That uh, turned out to be a pretty amazing invention, and you the, know from that the cartridge that allowed came. us to effectively, as stated, have lever actions. It allowed us to move on to other modern and just fan. I, I say yeah, fantastic, it, 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 but not only, other implements of destruction, if you will. It not only allowed us to come up with um, multi-round guns, uh, you know, I uh, the revolvers, the lever guns, but even just single shot guns, um, you know, like breech loaders and falling blocks and rolling blocks where they'd only have, you could only shoot one at a time, but you know, you, f you just feed the cartridge and it was much faster than putting another then, cap on it. And then wadding it down and then doing and this. And exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it it's sped things up quite a bit. Yes. It was also a lot better with weather as it all yeah. self-contained. Not that it couldn't erode you know, or degrade over time, but it was right. uh, it, it was less likely to be affected by just random humidity. Yes. Yeah. So they typically used a you know a lead projectile in it. Yep. Um, black powder and whatever the propellant was. Um, eventually, they came out with center fire, which had the little uh, primer cap primer in the center in, in the center of it, and. You know, they've turned out to be a lot more, uh, a lot better. You, various different size calipers. So, yeah. But yeah. Able to be reloaded. So, yep. Yep. Absolutely. You, you would have to, you know, uh, 
I would say 50% of the people out there shooting now reload because it's a lot less expensive. It's a, you know, more money as an initial investment, but um, it works it's, for people. It's also an art form sometimes. Yes. I mean, yes, it is. Especially you know, if you a, a design of, and cast your own rounds. Ugh. Exactly. And a lot of, uh, a lot of today's calibers start out as what's known as wildcat rounds where People would come up with their own uh, designs and, and uh, different uh, powder grains and bullet sizes and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, there's hundreds of calibers out there these days because, you know, somebody had a wild hair up his butt to, you know, make something that nobody else had, and, you know, now, because he wanted to shoot a buffalo. Now, hmm. now you say caliber. Can you explain what that is? Because that was used... <clears throat> That's used in modern day rounds. That was used back then, uh, in terms yes. of like the old steel balls. Everything was chambered in a caliber. Can you right. explain it's, what that is? It is talk a little bit about uh, talk a little bit about that. Sure. Caliber is the size of the projectile. Um, let's say, for instance, a, a, a forty five, whether it's Colt or ACP, is 0.45 inches in diameter. Um, a 22 is 0. 0.22 inches in diameter. Um, it's it's kind of simple. Europeans go with millimeters, obviously. The most common being the nine, nine millimeter. millimeter. Yep. Uh, the or the nine by the, nineteen uh, parabellum or or nine millimeter Luger. There's different names for it, but it's a. Uh, in reality, it's roughly the same size as a 38 or 357 they're very similar in diameter you know within a, a thousand a thousandths or so um you had a, you know, you had a question familiar with oh oh i said i, I could have sworn that caliber was actually based technically off of uh barrel diameter not bullet uh sizing but i could be wrong um you could also be right I' not sure, but, but I, this you, you know you get the idea. Um, yeah. So like uh, like with an AR-15, um, you know it, it shoots either a 5.56 NATO or 223. They're essentially the same thing, except five uh, five five six has a little bit more power behind it. Hmm. But they're essentially the same. Um, you know, it's it, it, whatever the number is, is usually, it, well, is the diameter yes. of the either the barrel or the bullet. And then there's special variants like Magnum or, like you said, NATO yes. and things of that nature. Uh, and that's all, you know, very specific to the rounds and what they're trying to do. Uh, Thirty, You know, like a 38 Smith & Wesson, you can't do in a 38 Special and blah, 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 blah. All sorts of right. fun, fancy things based yeah. off of exactly. super fanciness. Technically, it was yeah. uh, based off barrel to bore, but it's now commonly just kind of means the same shit. You know. Okay. Yeah. I stand corrected. But if and, it's and Magnum loads didn't come out till the mid-30s, and that was essentially That was war power. the 1930s, war. right? I'm sorry? The mid-1930s, correct with that? Yes, but we're ahead of ourselves, I guess. Yeah, we've that. jumped around a few different centuries. Well, we're stumbling. Yes. Right? A little bit. This is stumbling through history, so we're, you know, bouncing off different eras. But so. He's right. I know for being mm -hmm. in the Navy, they like to issue 9 mil as the standard side piece. And then from there, they tend to issue whatever they deem fit. Sometimes it's shotguns. Sometimes it's uh, rifles. Most of the time, though, you get a pistol. Whatever the situation needed. Yes. Uh, yeah. Also, we have ad we adopted uh, the nine millimeter sidearm, I believe, in 1984 <laughs> when, when we went to the Beretta to replace the um, yep the 1911-45. So, yeah. and it's still the standard NATO sidearm round. Uh, they actually updated it recently. I want to say within the past couple of years they updated it. I don't think it's fully okay. issued out in the replacement, 
You're talking the caliber of the round or a new pistol? New pistol. It's no longer the yeah. Beretta 9 mil. Was it's it? still a no, 9 no. mil, but what it's is it, a, a SIG. Hawk? Yeah, it's a SIG. It's, uh, okay, it's, it's a SIG 320, also known as the uh, M18 and M19, I believe. Yeah. So, uh, good guns. Yeah, but, SIGs got popular yeah. recently. SIGs are very good guns. So, not my weapon of choice, but you know I don't like plastic guns. I know you're uh, uh, you're a block. Smith guy, right? Um, I happen to love my Smith and Wesson revolvers, but I have really, really jumped on to the 1911 bandwagon, and the 1911 is my typical side carry. Does uh, it matter just so you the know, manufacturer? Of a 1911? For you, does it matter? No, not to me. Um, I have a, what do I have? I have a Rock Island government model. That is my standard carry. I, um, I have a Kimber, uh, commander size gun that I'm in the middle of quite some time, uh, modifying it. Mucking about. And eventually that'll be, what's that? Mucking about with it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's uh, the commander. You know, you can you can pay version, anywhere. Right? What's that? The commander's the uh, slightly smaller 1911, right? Yes, the four and a quarter barrel. Yeah, uh, there's there's a bunch of different variants inch. on uh, 1911s and you know specific issued guns and things of that. Just so you know, I'm take I'm being more sincere, taking this seriously now because I have my fez on. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> nice. He's got a fez. Yep. By George. So we've gone to plaid. We've gone to plaid. So, um, yeah. So I guess we're back. Where are we back at the Civil War? Uh, we're not quite Civil War. We were talking about uh, the engineer that in uh, invented the self-contained cartridge, and how right. that changed things. That allowed us the lever right. action. Uh, that allowed us bolt action. Uh, what was the first? Mm -hmm non-revolving cylinder style rifle it would be a breech loader um more uh, either a falling block or a rolling block um and it was it used a lever um but it didn't look like a lever action gun like you you know if you can picture a winchester in your head that had that long lever it was it was much smaller but it acted as the trigger guard and you cock it forward, and the block would either roll back or drop, hence rolling block, falling block. And then, you know, you would uh, extract your shell, the spent shell, and put a new one in. And, you know, somebody that was competent and good with it could probably, oh, I but would But it was say still probably technically a single uh, round, right? There was no, single shot. There was no yeah. multi chain uh no cartridge that allowed multi-shot for it um there were i don't remember who made them the manufacturers and stuff um the most common of course was the uh winchester lever guns um but uh there were other manufacturers of rifles that held more than one round and i lose you yeah um all right, so we were talking about, uh, yeah, so we would have the falling block, the rolling block. I'm talking uh, in terms of the, the uh, like a, a magazine, a clip, whatever you want to call it, in order to have mm -hmm. multiple rounds chambered at once. So right. we would have, like, the lever action. You, how can't it, have, you can't have multiple rounds chambered at once. Okay. But so, unless you have a double barrel oh, shotgun. Sure, phrasing, so, tricky words, hard phrases. Uh, yes. What if they had a three-barrel shotgun? That is a thing. Well, uh, you could do that too. But I'm just talking about having multiple rounds ready at once, effectively. Right, right. So they we would were... have lever action, bolt action. Uh, we eventually mm -hmm. move into the automatic realm. That's a little bit ahead of it. All right, what gun was that you were talking about? We were talking about how... Uh, we would have still single shot rounds with bolt action, lever action. Those would probably be right. the most popular uh, 
multi-fed, multi, multiple capacity, no longer single shot uh, style High weapons. High capacity guns, yeah. Yeah. And then from there, we end up devolving into uh, the... Devolving or evolving? Into fully semi-automatic <laughs> or uh, fully well, auto <laughs> as some... Daka, the, daka, the, daka, the, daka. the first... Uh, the first commonly used and, and first successful um, multi-round gun, uh, long gun, was the Henry rifle. There were other prototypes and guns that were invented that would hold um, numerous rounds, but they were not successful. They were cumbersome. They, you know, they had all kinds of flaws. The Henry was the first one that really took off. Yeah. Um, and it could hold, if I recall um 13 or 14 44 caliber center fire uh, rounds and they um <clears throat> excuse me they were pretty successful but henry himself couldn't afford to do it and winchester pretty much bought the design and, and manufactured the guns yeah um and that was a lever action you know, it, that was a lever action. Uh, they had a brass receiver, um, but That's there was the no four stock. Right? So, yeah, yes, it looks like the cowboy gun. It, uh, it had a brass uh, receiver. It didn't have a front stock, so you were kind of had your hand wrapped around the magazine and the barrel, which could get hot. Yes, uh, it was forty four, but it was pretty anemic. It, it, it was it was not a strong round. But there was a I don't know who everybody claims. Uh, that they said at first, but it was known as the gun that you could load on Sunday and shoot all the way till Friday because it had so many rounds. So, you know, there, there weren't a lot of them issued during the Civil War, and Winchester didn't come out with their own version that was Winchester designed until 1866, which was the model 1866. So, now, when did Gat so, do his first? He was also during the war, <clears throat> the Civil War, and Gatling. Oh, Gatling! Um, I think he was a doctor. He was, if I recall correctly, and he invented this gun, basically with the idea that to to specify, would, let's it, let's actually describe what a Gatling gun is really quick. It's <clears throat> sure. It's a lot of people use it as a multi-barrel chamber-fed. Uh, just rotating through the barrels in order to prevent overheat and in order to actually cycle through uh, very mm -hmm. well. But it's it just... Spinning one? Yeah, it's the one that actually spins. It's typically used... It's not typically used. It was almost exclusively used because it couldn't be used for anything else. It's just so big and cumbersome for war. And it took yeah. multiple people... Uh, just to use it, you needed one to aim, one to uh, load it, one to actually be able to fire it and rotate the actual crank right. in order to cycle through. It, and there was multiple was, designs that were based off of it. Some of it were water-cooled, some of it were air-cooled. Uh, you can see all sorts of different variants of it. Some of them had a, um, a clip or a magazine that would, like, spring load into them which you know whatever uh hmm. some of them had just these uh effectively if you've ever seen rambo the the straps oh the belts yeah the belt driven nah uh, nah that's, that's that's later on that's down the line but like and that's that that's not even uh it's not reality um the Gatling guns, they like you said, it, it, they were a, a crew-fed weapon. They were on a cart that was wheeled around. Sometimes you'd see them mounted in the back of uh, one of them old covered wagons. Yeah. But they were... Uh, very I think they large, were they, very cumbersome weapons of yes, war. very heavy. They... Um, it had a magazine. Yeah. Uh, it was magazine-fed. It held like 35 yeah, rounds, and six, bar six barrels would rotate. And it was the design of it. You have to, re you really have to mention this. The, the design of the gun was intended to end warfare. Uh, Dr. Gatling, when he invented this thing, 
figured that people would see that it's so destructive and 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 uh, pretty much the first um, weapon of mass destruction that people would be terrified of war and never want to have war again because now this there's this thing that he invented it and ironically he invented it to end warfare and the guy who so, made the cotton gin did it to end slavery and what <laughs> and the guy who made the cotton gin did it to end slavery and i think oppenheimer well, had the same idea behind the nuclear bomb too but you know yeah it, it's you know so supposed to be so terrifying that who would want to go to war against it and it, they didn't really, um, they, they weren't really during the time, they were invented during the Civil War, but very few people had them. Yes, it was, um, it was very, very hard to produce, very hard to manufacture, required a lot of money. Yes, it just it did. It was you a know, large, like, cumbersome piece, you know. Get one for yes. the channel. We'll get one for you the know, channel. You know, any... We'll just have it sitting here. Any... Uh, you know, any better than what was issued you gun was usually bought privately for the soldiers back then. And a lot of the uh, um, leaders of various different uh, outfits, um, they, they were, you know, usually wealthy industrialists or plantation owners or whatever. And they would outfit their men with uh, their weapons of choice. Yeah. So, you That's know, there's it, what's that? He's referencing Fat Boy Slim, yeah, the, weapon weapon, the weapon of choice. Yes. It's good you know, it was hard for uh, the South to get good weapons because they were all made up north. Yep. Um, so there were a lot of copies that were made in the South, but they weren't as high quality. Uh, to, they weren't as high quality and, and, and too little too late. So would you argue that uh, the Gatling is during its era the closest thing to an automatic right uh an automatic weapon yeah yeah absolutely it's it it's, was uh it was technically not I automatic mean, it, it was still single shot based off of the rotation but it was yep. able to do it at such speed such ease yes the faster you could crank and reload the fast you know the Isn't more the let it lay the down first considered the what the maxim the maxim hiram okay. maxim yes he he pretty much uh well that was the one you peed in yeah it, yes and no it, it, in that time frame you had colt manufacturing uh because samuel colt died in 1863 you know he didn't even Wait, his most famous died? spoiler alert yes yeah. yeah he got very sick he was he was a young man very wealthy but his wife uh you know continued the colt uh company and stuff but yeah, he, his most famous invention, the gun that won the West, the, you know, the 1873 single action army, he had nothing to do with that. He was dead and gone by then. That was 10 years after he passed. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> was that John Moses so, Browning? John Moses Browning, our Lord and Savior. He, uh, yeah, around the same time that Hiram Maxim and the Colt Company were uh, and various European companies were messing around trying to invent uh, machine guns. Um, yeah, he 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 had his hand in a lot of them. He sure did. He invent he designed and patented a lot of guns. He was he was brilliant. Um, Hiram Maxim sounds German, but he was an American, and he uh, basically invented the maximum machine gun which was a very good gun <clears throat> excuse me it was magazine fed if i remember correctly um but there wasn't a market for it here you know we weren't really at war and, and uh, uh the american government being very stiff uh, didn't want to spend that kind of money and felt they didn't need that kind of weapon um, so he, as a lot of gun manufacturers and designers that were here went over to Europe because there was always war in Europe. So a lot of countries. Yeah, exactly. So it, it uh, um, you know, he, he, uh, they all came about around the same time. Hmm. Um, what's his name? Moses lived until the mid 1920s he was born in 
oh golly, I think the 1860s or 1870s. Um, oh, and he had, era. yes, it truly is. He had, uh, um, oh my God, probably hundreds of patents for various different firearms and, and other implement, uh, other things and, and parts for firearms. He was just brilliant. He, he, they say he had the ability to, uh, think in 3d and that's how he was able to invent things. However, it was his brother. And I can't remember his name because he had numerous brothers, uh, was the one that made it work. Hmm. John Moses would, uh, come up with the idea and write it down and give it to his brother and say, here, make this. So hmm. they made a good team. But the, uh, and Hiram Maxim, I believe it was his son that invented the suppressors, the first suppressors huh. again hmm. over in Europe. You know, no. but designers back then, um, like say Browning, for instance, you know, if, if if Winchester didn't want to buy his latest gun, he'd go across the street to Remington or somebody else. You know, um, yeah. that happened yeah. all the time. The uh, yeah, exactly. He, he did a lot of work in Belgium with FN, uh, Fabrique Nationale. They uh, his last design that he was really good was the uh what's known as the browning high power um but he died before it came out uh, the guy who was the mass the, the biggest greatest gunsmith inventor whatever over in in belgium finished the, the design because browning dropped dead in, in belgium of a heart attack hmm. so when he was over there wasn't the browning high power well, the kind of looked like a 1911 but fires nine millimeter it's similar to the 1911, yes. There are some distinct differences, but it is similar to it. Um, it's 9mm, and it's... Uh, the French name was like Grand Grande Percent or something like that. A high power, it wasn't because it was so powerful. It was high capacity. Uh, That's what the high was. It was... Um, Belgium wanted a new sidearm for its armory, army, and... and uh, they in turn didn't want it when it came out and France took it. Hmm. So, Those but they were manufactured all, all over the country, um, all over the world, actually. Uh, Brownie, they came out from Browning, from FN, um, you know, everybody made them. What's weird is during World War II, when the Nazis invaded Belgium, they took over that plant. So some Nazi soldiers had high powers. However, the designs were for it were smuggled out and went to Canada, um, a company called Inglese, I-N-G-L-E-S-E, -E, uh, started producing high powers. And most of those went to the Chinese nationals, hmm. um, you know, when they were fighting off the, the Japs. So the high power is a fantastic weapon. It's, it, it is very similar looking and um, size of a 1911. It, the original ones carry 12 rounds. Um, now newer ones can carry up to 15 or 16, but they, they are a really good weapon. It's a good shooting gun. If you ever get a chance to fire one, I highly recommend it. Interesting. Yeah. Now we probably jumped way ahead of ourselves. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> We've been kind of going through the history here. Yeah. But, Touching it all. But yeah, we were in the Civil War and, you know, we just got up to World War II. And we skipped over some stuff. Yeah. Uh, ah, there were minor skirmishes. I could have sworn there was like something before World War II. World War One. No, that doesn't sound right. Uh, <laughs> there was always war in Europe. There was... Uh, um, Russia was uh, invading we don't, Finland. Yeah we, don't, yeah, we don't have to talk about all of the wars that happened in Europe. Yeah. If we do, we'll be here for another three hours. Yeah. yeah. Literally just mentioning yeah, always, a third of them. Exactly. It, skirmishes, war, I mean, literally all the time. <clears throat> Police action. Yeah. That was another big one. <laughs> but banana republics. Yeah. So we where do we up, want to go back to? 
we ended up uh, talking about Gatling and talking about Civil mm-hmm. War, things of that Excellent. nature, getting loosely into the innovation duck, of duck, the automatic. Duck, 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 duck. Uh, we mentioned Maxim. Right. And then mm-hmm. from there, uh, what actually defines an automatic weapon versus a semi-automatic weapon? It's, uh, uh, to me, an automatic weapon, it, it fires the next round off of recoil or it, it uses the recoil um, to load the next round. However, as opposed to a semi-automatic where it would stop firing, you have to semi-automatic, you have to pull the trigger for each shot. So, so the automatics, you pull the trigger once and all the bullets come out. It automatically um, fires. It, it's basically a series of springs and levers that makes it fully automatic. Um, you know, but it, it works off of recoil. Yes. You know, like any semi-automatic weapon, uh, automatic weapons operate off of recoil. You know, the, the gas or uh, either the blowback of the pressure or gas operated. Yep. Like say an AR-15 is gas operated. There's a, there's a little gas port near the end of the barrel and when the bullet goes through, that gas goes up and, you know, back into the, uh, mm. just above the chamber, into the receiver, and forces the bolt back. And, and ejects the cartridge. Has a heavy spring. Exactly. It, it's, it, you know, it's... It's a it very amazes. self-contained thing. Yeah, it amazes me that all this stuff was designed way back when. Um, and every part does multiple multiple functions. Yeah, it, it's uh, uh, how these people came up with these things is just mind boggling. But you know, after working on them and stuff and fiddling around with them, you, you're like, wow, how did they come up with something this great? You know, uh, we're still in Civil War, just pre Civil War. Let's. Let's talk about some of the little side pieces that people started to carry. Things started to get smaller and smaller, more self-defense oriented. It was less, uh, less just you know, hunters coming around with rifles. People needed to come right. around with more self-defense rounds. Uh, mm-hmm. You had your. We had your, obviously uh, the Derringer. So. Yeah, and okay, here's a history thing. I don't know if you guys know it, but Derringer, the guy's name was. Philip, I believe, or John Derringer? No, the original Derringer only had one R in the middle of it. Anything else that has two R's is not an original Derringer. But the original Derringers were made back in the early 1800s. And in fact, John Wilkes Booth used a 44 caliber Derringer to, uh, to put do a hole the in Abraham Lincoln's head. Yep. Um, and those are notable anything... because they're very small, very concealable just yes yes pocket they're small pistols, pocket, if you will. pocket guns but they typically have either one or two shots yes um and that's it you know it, it, they're uh but, very yeah, very small original. very small barrel basically Easy just to up close and yeah up close and personal for, yeah yes as it's you know, referred for social, to for social situations yeah um and those started to get yeah. notoriety just because Obviously, with more and more people coming about, more and more population, more and more yeah. uh, crime, more and more just situations of, arose. As as the country was growing, you know, you hear the Wild West and you picture everybody walking around with, a, uh, you know, a colt on their side and a, a Winchester over their shoulder. That was not really the case. Um, a lot of people you know, had a pocket lot of, guns in, you know, pockets. In yeah, boots. because... Uh, uh, a lot of cities didn't allow guns within the city limits. Um, they would be, you know, things would become too violent. So that's where the pocket guns, the derringers, really came into play. It was something to hide easily. And that was its but, own. Uh, that that is its own market, its own forte. So the cowboy movies lied. Yes. Me. Yeah. The cowboys movie. The lied. what? The cowboy yes, movies lied. Did. Aww. Yep. Not everybody carried a gun. You know, and, and the the whole thing about meeting out in the street at high noon. There's, you know, very few um, actual reputable uh, uh, accounts of that. Actual, exactly. You know, one of them being with uh, Wild Bill Hickok. But uh, 
it, you know, there's there's not a lot of history proving that that happened all the time. Most gunfights were over in a matter of seconds, and it was either just, you know, in a bar because somebody spilled a drink or took, you know, danced with somebody's gal. They thought that they or, were cheating uh, at a card game. Yeah, they, card you know. Game. Cheat. Or, uh, you know, a, a lot of famous assassins back then were sneaky bastards that shoot you in the back, you know, wait for you in a dark alley and shoot you that way. So, you know, the, the idea of having, you know, everybody facing off in the, in, in the, on the main street is is really kind of nonsensical, you know, it just, it, it you know, because by then it, that would be considered dueling and dueling was illegal at that point. So oh, depending on the state. True, true. But pretty much by the 1820s or 1830s, dueling was more or less outlawed, outlawed throughout. No, yeah. No. Well, Texas yeah. outlawed Bowie nice to get uh, stop dueling. Yeah, that's what? For a long time, Bowie knives were technically illegal in Texas because of dueling. Who dueled with a knife? Uh, some people who like couldn't duel with a pistol. Well, I don't. I, I think that would just be considered a, you know, a crazy fight with a, with, a, in my opinion, anyway. Um, yeah, I, India I, I can't if to, India has uh, taught me anything, dueling, just pull out a gun and shoot. No, no, yeah, no need to go uh, with a sword versus a whip. <clears throat> Yeah, as the old saying is, you know, why bring a knife to a gunfight? Um, the idea of dueling is where two gentlemen uh, square off and and uh, it, it's for two people it trying to kill back each for, other. It, it's, forever. It's rather civilized. Um, oh, I challenge people can to do this all the time on Twitter. Yeah, it's it, so much fun. It 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 mm -hmm. it dates back to forever. I, yeah, it it, it does. But, but during this time, obviously, uh, we had more up close and personal things going uh, with like the Derringer and more concealable guns. But we correct. also had for weapons of war, things getting bigger and bigger, as mentioned previously, the Gatling gun, different versions mm -hmm. of cannons, uh, right. just different rounds that would end up being you know, used for implements of destruction, used for yep. naval warfare, for land warfare. Mm-hmm. Things of that nature. Yep. And then, that is correct. And then we slowly started implementing guns on airplanes, and, well, that's a whole different yeah. topic. <laughs> the innovation there, just in order to not clip the propeller as you're shooting, oh, Hmm. Is amazing. It, oh my it's, god! I can't think of the the name of the 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 thing. I think it was articulator or something. I I don't know, but it would they would fire off the engine basically. Yep. You know, as as the prop would rotate, it had this you know bell cranks and rods and all kinds of stuff that would um, either allow the gun to fire or to to not let it fire. Yeah. And it happened so instantaneously. It was incredible. It, again, you know, think about the time, how crude things were at the times. Well, that started the getting implemented in, in what, the 1900s? Air, yeah, World War Air Force? Uh, well, Air Warfare, Air Warfare didn't, it didn't start until World War One, 1914. Yeah. I mean, That's what and a lot of the time, five, few it, before, they, before, before they even started yeah. mounting um, machine, machine guns, guns to weapons, on, they would have people on, uh, in planes shooting with rifles. Yeah. Rifles or handguns, yeah. you know, or you, you have effectively uh, super fancy like... cavalry. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> it's, it's really the way it was. And you weren't shooting at the airplane; you were shooting at the pilot. Which, mm -hmm. you know, a hundred yards while you're flying around, it's almost impossible. Yeah. So we had it, bombs it's, getting uh, dropped, which yeah, they would carry little bombs and throw them out of the cockpit. We can How we can talk about is that. Well, we can talk about guns range. and explosives that way, like grenades and yeah. bombs. That all started getting implemented. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, steel rain is the best. Wait, do you know what steel, steel rain, rain is? What is I it? believe he's referring to effectively just uh, a whole bunch of metal lawn darts that got dropped instead of grenades. Yeah, steel rain. Oh, cool. Flaches. Yeah. yeah. Let me... You know, some of the weapons that they came up with during World War One and World War Two for nothing crazy to say. Nothing that. causes more innovation than war. It's it's, it's the insane. truth. 
It's the truth. Have you ever heard of a bat bomb? Oh, yeah, the bat bombs were great. Were they yep. hooked up bombs to bats? Yep, yeah, and so, sent them over to Japan yep. to start uh, fires. Yeah, and so they, <laughs> and they used little incendiary bombs, and, but they never actually deployed them because they just ended up using the nuke. Yeah, among other well, things. Well, before, before that... We just firebombed be, them regularly we, anyway because their buildings were all made of wood. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the actual firebombings of Tokyo caused more death and destruction than the two uh, atomic bombs combined. You know, it, it yeah, it, it just, yeah, you know, it was we. The shock factor what, the two. Oh, yeah. Well, there was we nothing went, at the time that was ever even close to the just sheer firepower of one atomic bomb. It exactly. would take. That's, it, it would take dozens of planes and dozens of carpet bombings and fire bombs in order to do the same amount of destructive damage as one atomic bomb. True. And True. The, the, there was, that was it atomic was just, bombs were basically shock and awe. Yes. You know, it, 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 it was it, the it, show off of don't fuck with us. Yeah. And Fapo. it worked. Fuck around, find out. And it worked because nobody knew how many we had. Right. I think we literally used like the only three we had at the time for that. We used two. One to test. We used two, and we lost the third, if I recall. I thought we had that one for testing. And... Well, I mean, one that was actually supposed to be dropped, or one that was able I, to be I, dropped. I believe we I lost know, the third but one. If you know, in in the we've uh, lost a few nukes over of time, the course of yes. time. Yeah, there's one off of the it, coast of Savannah, Georgia, somewhere. Oh yeah, I think there's one in the presently in the Florida swamps right now too. Could be. Or North Carolina swamps, one or the other. Interesting fact. Um, I think it's. It, Venus, it could be there too. Who knows? Interesting fact: but, um, Venus fly traps are actually native to North Carolina swamps. Hmm. What? Do you know the Venus fly trap? Yes, yeah, I've heard of them. They're actually native to North Carolina swamps. They're huh. not some weird oh, cool. like Amazon flower. They're actually like from America, like right down the road, Neat. basically. I mean, technically, yes, it's down the road. It's just really long down the road. <laughs> really, just a, just a quick trip down the road, 500 plus miles from where we're currently located. But, uh, yep. I don't know, just weird swamp fact. But, yeah, we can get into bombs and all of that in different That's topics. That's a whole other topic. Yeah. Uh, cannonballs never exploded, okay? Mm hmm. Traditional cannonballs never exploded. No, they just right. punctured through everything they passed. Oh, yeah. And if it did explode, something went wrong. But yeah. Same thing with grape shot. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about shotguns for a little bit, which is effect okay. it, it effectively was just, you know, a lot of steel balls loaded into muskets at the time. That's where it evolved from. Correct. And then from Correct. there, it ended up getting Becoming its own self yeah, it ended up getting its own, you know, self-contained uh, cartridge, its own self-contained round, just like it did with rifles and pistols. Yeah. And it's just meant to, you know, throw out little balls, little whatever it's loaded with as the actual round, because you yeah. can do all yeah, sorts were, of silly things with those. Uh, they were originally a dude, intended for, for bird hunting. Oh, yeah, I've seen that guy. They were originally tested Shotgun for what? bird hunting that's yeah. what the shot is for is, is say if you're loading number eight shot you have you know 500 teeny little pbs inside your uh shell and they spread out yeah and that gives you more of a chance of hitting your you know what you're shooting your the bird um birds be tiny sometimes so, if they're real yeah yeah and then somebody decided well if we can do that we can put you know, slightly larger. Put in, yeah, how about we put in nine 38 caliber lead balls into a single shell and we'll call it mm, a double op buck? And, and that's uh, a, you know, a, that does damage. That does a lot of damage. Um, you know, a, a lot of uh, the original shotgun shells were paper cartridges and then they went to brass. Um, they were back and forth between brass and paper but you know uh, but we put shotguns to very good use during warfare yes 
so. <laughs> until the Germans got too scared of them. Yeah, it, that's the but, truth. They, yeah, you know the Germans. Um, I guess during, from the Hague Convention or whatever, but they were terrified because, you know, our Marines would jump into the the trenches with them uh, and just start the shooting. trenches. Yeah, and the guns had slam fire, which basically you just hold the trigger and keep pumping it. And then the Hang crazy on, bastards that? put bayonets on them too. Yeah. What? Oh, dogs. Um, but yeah, they thought they a were very cool. rudimentary form of automatic. Mm, yeah. Yes and no. It's it. It it wasn't recall. Uh, anything like that, it, you know, you had to actually do uh, because it was a pump action gun. You had to do it. Uh, it, it. It wasn't automatic. It was just faster than having to pull the trigger every time. Strong enough grip. It was automatic. What's that? Strong enough grip. It was automatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> debatable. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, yeah. So the, shotguns are, are still used extremely effectively today. I mean, that's yes, one of the are. things that look at gets issued to Reeves. us. Mm-hmm. What'd you say? So look at Keanu look at Reeves. Keanu Reeves. Look at Dick Cheney. Uh, ah, yes. Yeah. Reference. Yep. Old reference. Yeah, that's a few years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the you know kids that watch us for some reason, don't. Yeah, don't. And uh, Dick Cheney was a former vice president. He shot a guy in the face with birdshot. It was a hunting accident. Allegedly. Hey, the guy survived. And the guy, the guy survived. But mm, very, very weird. Uh, yeah. It's almost like he wasn't following the, you know, safety rules. As we nope. laid out in the very beginning of the, the, the video. Yes. Mm-hmm. Never aim your gun at anything you're not willing to destroy. Yeah, that's effectively what I said. Yep. Effectively. That's correct. But they're just oh, from the Civil War. We ended up going into, you know, effectively a sl- everything, a slight downtime, and then we had another war. And then we yep. had a slight downtime. And then we had another war. And then, you know, World War Two ha- uh, World War I happens. We had some wars before that, too. The Spanish, the Philippines. Well, that's why I said from Civil Spanish. War to World War One, we had another war, then a little bit of downtime. Then another war, then a little bit of downtime. Mm. We had yep. probably about uh, three or four wars in between the Civil War and World War One. I. I don't I know uh, exactly. The one in the Philippines is when we adopted 45, car, uh, 45 caliper for a while. Yeah. Because uh, they were on drugs and 38 wasn't doing the trick. They were on a lot of drugs and they had the, the very tightly woven, like, cotton uh, or uh, wool, like, just effectively and, I mean, just very crude body of- armor. Look at the size of a Samoan. You think a thirty eight is going to take them down? That's basically what happened. So. I mean, she's not wrong there. No, yeah, I'm not. I don't think a thirty eight would stop the rock. No, especially <laughs> if he's, you know, uh, on PC. He, he flexed fueled. out of a cast. I saw that movie. I saw that movie. He flexed out of a cast. He carried a minigun in hand. Like, come on. Okay, well, I, I, I think uh, Jason again, the Body Ventura did that in The Predator first, so... Wait, was it the... Again, you know... Was it Jesse that's, Ventura? That's, 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 it, it can't really happen. What? Are you, know, you telling me you just, can't flex out of a cast and then carry a minigun? Ugh. Uh, if there's well, one maybe, thing the movies have taught me movie. anything... Yeah. It's that if you're so. big and strong enough with enough charisma, you can do anything you want. I Look at you, so. Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to have to uh, bow out soon. Maybe we could do a part two some other time. We'll do a part two, and we will talk about more specific manufacturers. Oh, yeah, let's just even sure. Okay. So, sounds groovy. Uh, this has been Stumbling Down History Road. We didn't really stumble mm-hmm. that much. Yeah, a little bit. 
Nope. But uh, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Peace. Thanks for having me, guys. Be well. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.